Come on. I'll be lucky. That was like the funniest thing. I never brought it up because I was like, but like I just I was like, oh shit, okay, that's where we're at. But it devolved into that it did because so many people took it, took it wrongly, and were turning it into a joke on everything. And they were they were the boy who cried wolf, where everyone's just. And then when the real wolf came, nobody listened, and that's the real danger of it. Nobody should be taking BLM as a way to like. It, like it put white guilt on people that literally had nothing to do with anything going on, but they just say, Oh no, you're white. So you benefited from this. So fuck you or whatever. It's like, is that what you want to do? Because if you want to, then acknowledge the fact that all you want is to be in control of white people. So let's be honest about what you really want, because some people that is other people don't, they just want it to be brought to light. They want it to be like, you know what? I've actually have lived with this. I don't like the way that I see things. This happens to me on a regular basis. But because you've got people that take it and turn it into such a fucking mess and ruin it, essentially for the three women that started Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. because there was a good cause for it, you know? But they're, they're, they're really ruining it for what it actually should stand for. And anytime something like this happens, you've got those bad actors or those people that just take it and like... They just want attention. And when they do that, they ruin the very nature of what other people are trying to do. And then what happens is the people that are out there, they're now fighting for a banner that is tainted. And like ever, like again, just like the Me Too thing, they're, they're, it's just, it's a tainted title. So now they got to come up with a new hashtag, which mm -hmm. you, we shouldn't be looking for hashtags anyways, because guess what? If Hitler was around today, his whole slogan would be a hashtag. Hashtags and they would be Kyle. using, they would, yeah, they would be, and they're, pro they're already doing that. The, the, the fucking KKK guys in the South or whatever, whoever's a part of that shit, those guys probably use it as a hashtag. So understand the parallels between the things that you're doing, what other people are doing and be like, oh, that's what they did. And things were really shitty. Let's not do that. And let's not dilute what the meaning of racism actually is what the meaning of sexual abuse is what the meaning of rape is let's not dilute these very very powerful words and because i feel when i see things like that that a lot of people are using words that they don't actually know the meaning of mm -hmm. and and it's a it's a very dangerous thing to do and i really hope that the more people notice the craziness on both sides because there is craziness on both sides right and if when people are acknowledging that and they're like oh this is actually the exact same thing just there's a different name to it or people are using it differently then they'll realize like oh the middle is actually a good way to go which is essentially don't be a piece of shit don't be a jerk to people understand that maybe there are more layers than what you're saying and understand the power of the words you are saying so that we don't end up diluting them to the point where the words mean nothing. Because that's thing. the most powerful thing we have. So before we move on from this topic, I want to say the last mm -hmm. thing. It's reminded me of this. Uh, back in high school, like grade 12 year, I had a really SJW teacher who uh, basically hated all white people. Like she was white herself, but you know, like, it was one of those like very white apologist. Yeah. And there were many times where just like, cause I like, I like having debates. I like having debates and I always play devil's advocate. So I tell my teachers this and everybody knows this about me. You know, like I had a really liberal history teacher who we had a heated debate and he said, guys, listen, you know, Anthony's just trying to stir the pot. Like 
he's just doing this so we can actually have a discussion, not just, you know, 30 people having the quote unquote same idea just because like some are too afraid to actually go ahead and say anything else. Cause basically in my high school, you were bullied into submission. You had to think the same way. I was called a white supremacist by my teacher. I was getting blamed for uh, acts that Canadians did to indigenous people. And that was kind of the last job where I told my teacher, I said, listen, I'm a Greek Italian. Like my grandparents came here from Italy and Greece and were scorned, mocked, teased, made fun of, like they were belittled. They were, it wasn't, you know, the high life when they came over, like they went through hell. So don't try and, you know, pin the blame on me just because I do have white skin, which is the big issue. Because if you have white skin, you're kind of just assumed the enemy. And it's like, I know it's kind of, we do have certain privileges and we do have that, even though I am not quote unquote white, but it's just something that always annoyed me was that I was always just kind of lumped in as the bad guy. And when it's like, our ancestors also didn't have a great time coming over. It's not like everybody who has white skin was immediately an enemy. And that's the biggest issue is that lots of people treat white people as the enemy. Just like how not all black people are criminals and, you know, not all black people are murderers. Not all white people are fucking racist bigots. There are a couple. There are quite a few. But if we just start, you know, treating everybody as the same and kind of enforcing stereotypes on both ends... It's not going to end out in a good result. It's going to end out in mass conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've seen it happen in the past. It's happened so many times in the past with every single culture. And I think if more people were able to acknowledge that and see that that stuff has happened, then they'll actually, you know, realize that, oh, there is a different and better way to do it. And also, maybe things aren't as bad as we think they are, too. Mm -hmm. If we do not learn, Um, like as they say, if we don't learn from her history, we're doomed to repeat it. And currently, I don't know, it seems like on both ends, I'm not blaming a certain person, I'm not blaming a certain, you know, whatever. On both ends, it seems like it's kind of just two extremes kind of going at it right now. Absolutely. Yeah, that's (laughs) it. And then there's people in the middle that are not sure what to do about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But okay. Let's, uh, Let's finally get into our our stuff that's how vast oh, joins the one conversation more... back yeah vast vast who doesn't yeah do you have anything to say vast there's nothing i don't think so yeah. I, don't think I would even attempt it so i'm just gonna say good job guys <laughs> all right hey that's more than uh we've ever gotten from you on know, topics like that i do have one more i guess it's going to be a reverse thing where we're going to do our pitch for um part two mm. so um i do have one more thing in terms of video games, this is going to go off another, like now we're like just bouncing to video games. Mm-hmm. I saw an article, because it's our last one, I just wanted to bring it up. Are video games becoming too long? And is that a sustainable model? Because one guy was saying that it's not sustainable for us to make these massive hundred hour or so games because of the amount of resources and time and effort and all of that stuff that that it takes. So I ask you guys, I don't know what kind of games, Anthony, like the length of the the Nintendo games or some of the games that you like are, Mm. but I know for me and Vaz, some of those major RPGs, you know, we've put in 50 to 100 hours in. So gentlemen, I ask, are video games getting too long and do we need to, as a, as a, as a, as gamers be like, no, we're actually okay with getting shorter games. Well, I think it depends because like, Looking at it from a Nintendo perspective, when I do play those AAA games like uh, Mario Odyssey, for example, that one was like all Mario games have this issue where they're all like really fun to play and you kind of just end up binging the game, but it's not really that long of a story. And you kind of just meet that wall where it's like you beat it, but it's also like, well, you know, I fucking finished it in like two days. So that's done. So I think games need to be a bit longer, honestly. Like, I know RPGs are different than platformers and just, you know, action games like Mario would kind of be classified in. But I just think in general, like, games like Spider-Man for PS4, that was a fucking super short game. That was, like, I was really actually kind of ticked off. I'm like, oh, I already beat this game. Like, I wasn't really exploring, but I was also, like, not rushing through the game. Like, I was pretty much just taking my time and kind of just exploring a bit, but also, like, not getting too sidetracked. So I would prefer if they were, I don't know, like a bit beefier. Like I think the Arkham games, from my memory, I haven't played them in a while, but I think those were like pretty 
well-length games where it wasn't too much where you got oversaturated, but also it wasn't, you know, too little where you were ended up wanting more and not satisfied. Okay. Vass? Uh, I agree completely with Anthony. It's like, especially now that games like uh, PS5 projected that their average game price will now be minimum $80. Like, I'm not sure. If, is it that now? I can't remember. Isn't it 79 Oh, it's already $90 in Canada, so. So there you go. Like, I mean, we're paying tooth and nail for all these games. And I do remember the time when it was like fifty nine ninety nine for a game. And like the EA games, like the sports games are usually cheaper just because there was nothing mm. new about it. But the ones that like were like the Assassin's Creed and stuff, okay, 60 bucks for like the base. Now, number one, there wasn't like two options like it was back then. Now there's like five, six options and pricing and all that kind of stuff. So the more we pay, the more you want to receive in back. Like, I mean, um, I think like the Odyssey game, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is the most I've paid for a game in a very long time. Uh, I paid the full amount, like 150 bucks. But how many uh extras are on that game like i get my money's worth there's so much stuff there's almost you feel like there's too much however if there's any less i probably would have felt cheated like i i definitely need that value for what you're paying for and games are becoming a premium yes they're getting more intense but they need to like fulfill those those needs and like people want to feel like they've paid for something worth it not like i mean you paid for last of us and you returned it right away you didn't feel the need to hold on to it in your library because it wasn't worth it it wasn't that good of a game you you took your hit on whatever you bought it for whatever i'm not sure if you did or if it was a good trade whatever yeah it was like a 30 dollar hit so there you go you took the hit on a game you you thought was going to be great you might have held on to it but didn't turn out to be what it should have and like a part of you feels cheated or you you know the game now. So you're like, I'll take the hit. Doesn't matter. I'll play my game and call it a day. So I don't know. And you definitely want that value there. So games getting shorter. I don't think it's worth it. I think people are going to be the price has to reflect it. Then I would say that's the biggest thing is the price has to reflect the game you're getting. If it's like 100 hours, it should be this price range. If it's over 200 or over 300 hours gameplay, then price it accordingly i guess you could say so that could could get games a little rowdy too you know what i'm saying so maybe not just dlcs you have other stuff too so i'm not sure but definitely you want that value well i'm glad you brought that up because that was the one thing i was thinking about the whole time where it's like if these games were cheaper like i don't feel cheated by um last of us because that 80 dollars i spent there 50 of it like i essentially paid 30 bucks for the game then Mm because i got 50 back so I lost 30, but essentially that means that I only paid $30 for that game, which it's well worth $30. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rest of it can go into Ghosts of Shushima, which then, you know, I'm only going to pay less money for it, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing that money from one game into another, and then I, by the looks of it, I'll get more of my money's worth. So that's kind of like... You know, it's it's the it's the trade off, I guess. Well, you're you know? getting but, yeah, two if, games for sixty bucks, right? Because if you got fifty back on that one and put fifty and paid off ghosts, so that's actually yes. a pretty good deal. Yeah, fuck. So where, but I'm glad you brought up value for what you get because yeah, like The Witcher Three, for instance, I adored and I used that as a benchmark because it was seventy bucks. You got the CD, you got two extra. The game itself was almost a hundred hours or so, which you could put in if you're like exploring and stuff. And they gave you two five hour or so, D, like five to seven hour DLCs for free for that price. I've never seen value like that, and I don't know if we'll see value like that. With Spider-Man, it's interesting because you brought up a good point. It is relatively short. You can kind of burn through it, but it's long in comparison to maybe some other games. But if you're sitting there and you swing for an hour like me, like there's times where I spend hours just swinging and fighting crime. Mm -hmm. And like that gives me a Spider-Man feel, and I get super into that part. Yeah. But to your point, if you're not going to spend that time swinging around and doing that, is it as worth it? Mm-hmm. Like, and if they make, I think Vass, you had it right. Where if they, if the the time allotted is reflected on the price, or vice versa, the price reflects how much time. You know, if you're paying fifty bucks for a game, not eighty bucks for a game, then you're going to get a pretty straightforward, but you know, solid game. Um, it's only going to be maybe fifteen to twenty hour, or sorry. Yeah, maybe 10 hours or so, something like that. 
and you're going to get enough out of it. You're going to get a good solid weekend out of it for 50 bucks. You know, because the reality is you can go out drinking that beer, for instance, that you paid 50, but like you get some drinks for 50 bucks. That's gone now. All it is is memories, you know, memories that are hard to remember. It's it's interesting. Exactly. And I really like my RPGs. Like I like games that are super involved. I felt Assassin's Creed Odyssey was way too much. I was exhausted by that game. I was like, I need this game to finish. And I need something to come up because it's way too fucking long. And then with Red Dead Redemption, there was so much stuff in it. Like things that they had to pay developers for, like the fact that the balls on the horse contracted when you got into colder temperatures that honestly, I don't even think I paid attention to. Mm-hmm. Well, you know? so fucking and that game was see. so much deep. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly, I guess. But like the, the it was just so much detail put in which i appreciate but very very few people are going to respect enough for it to matter on a monetary value so i don't know it's interesting because i think he's got a point from a business perspective it is hard to make those games that are that long and i I, you would have to like would you guys be open to let's say a developer pay you paying 50 bucks for a game and then there was another so 50 dollar game 20 hours of gameplay and then a five hour DLC for 10 bucks. Uh, good. See DLC for 10 bucks. If it was like a good deal, say if Spider-Man's DLC was 10 bucks, I would buy it. Like I would have no issue with that kind of pricing, but I do not like buying an $80 game or a $90 game and then paying a $50 DLC. I don't need to pay mm-hmm. for you to cut out a portion of the game and then give it to me in two months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. If it, for 50 bucks, yeah, like as it is now, I really don't give a shit about DLC. I think the last DLC I bought was for Dragon Ball Kakarot, and that's just because I fucking love Dragon Ball, and I'm a simp for Dragon Ball. So anything mm-hmm. they do, I throw money at. But for games that are kind of like yeah. Spider-Man, where if I have to wait you know, three months for a DLC, I'll probably just sell the game because or I still have a game, but I just kind of you know, lost interest naturally because I saw it on YouTube when it came out and that was kind of just good enough for me. Right. Fast? Not much sad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. <laughs> Thanks, Fast. Uh, I, I, I think if uh, when you get a console that's going to cost 700 bucks or so, because it's going to cost like that to, in Canada because it's so fucking expensive, and you add in all of that extra stuff, and you're not, and you have to constantly pay for more of the game to the point where you've spent $150, like it's, but then like they've, they've essentially forced a hundred hour game in there. Like Assassin's Creed Odyssey just felt like a cash grab where they just threw the same thing in over and over again, Mm -hmm. just to justify the price. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, I've spent so much time, but I didn't really enjoy it. I felt exhausted and it felt like a chore. And, but at the same time, I guess I got my money's worth out of it because I spent over a hundred hours on the game. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like they did, like, it didn't feel the same way. Whereas, like I will like when I look at the Witcher three or I look at even, um, you know, even Spider-Man, but I I don't forget, remember how much I paid for Spider-Man. But when I look at a game like the Witcher three, or I look at old, older games that was like, you got the game and that's it. Yeah. Like we got GoldenEye. We played fucking GoldenEye. Ocarina of time. We played the living daylights out of, and it was Ocarina of time. There was no DLC. There was no nothing like that. And I would be okay if, the companies did that. And I'm pretty sure like the other thing you have to consider is that how many people are going to lose their jobs if they go that route too, Mm -hmm. you know? And and I think that is something that you can't, we can't take for granted either because it's just like, okay, well this studio, Sony Santa Monica is no longer making games that are over 15 to 20 hours. Now we got to lay off half of our staff because we don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. Now what's going to happen? You know, I, I mean, it, at first, it's going to be very difficult. I think eventually the marketplace is going to allow it so more independent developers, like those people that got laid off, could eventually pool their money together and then come up with another studio, for instance, and then start competing. Because I think that's I think that's the way of the future, I think. I think the more independent developers show up, I think the better it's going to be for the industry overall because it'll have more competition. Well, it's like know? movies. Like nobody wants to, like for example, like Disney, nobody wants to watch 
you know, a mo- every single movie in a theater that's just made by one studio. You want to have that diversity. You want to have like the different style, which is why a lot of these like indie games from the PS5 event, like they didn't look amazing, but I was thinking, you know what? These look pretty fun. Like, I don't really think I've played a game in a while that's kind of been like this kind of play style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, even like when you look at some of the platformers that are, mm-hmm. you know, traditionally Nintendo or something, and you look at some of those games, like, oh, those, yeah, those do look fun. And that's the other thing. I think the video game industry is very much turning into what the movie industry is now because there's a massive push for like no longer to have those big superhero blockbusters. Yeah. So now is there going to be like there was the independent movement of the early nineties and then we ended up getting some smaller blockbusters, obviously our, like this last uh, 10 years or so, 11 years or whatever it was, was big superhero movies, blockbusters universes, but like, you know, that expanded off the trilogies all from one place. But then you see companies like a 24 Blumhouse make these, awesome awesome horror movies Mm -hmm. that are very unique and you're seeing more you know movies like hereditary or midsummer or you're seeing remakes of classics like that halloween movie that like i know you love the uh anthony Mm -hmm. and it's like you know there it seems like there's more competition which is making the whole pool a little bit more for lack of a better term diverse in the art art that we're receiving and I think video games are going to get that way too, where, yeah, it is like there's too many. We're not able to finish all of these games until the next one comes out. And how much replayability do a lot of them have? And so, like, I've just, like, we talked about paying $100, $150 for a game. Yeah, they'll add on like a statue and some other stuff, but it's it's really hard to judge if, like, what they're going to do for the PS5 when they have all that tech. I guess we'll find out when they actually start releasing some shit and hopefully they've, you know, decide to go out with more wacky games and not wacky in a bad sense, just wacky and, you know, not going to be the same cookie cutter bullshit kind of like what Call of Duty has been for the past couple of years until recently. Like this year was the best Call of Duty they've released since fucking like I'd say MW3. Mm-hmm. Like it's, mm-hmm. you know, people are actually invested in it. It has a ranked kind of like mindset to it. The gameplay, like, I cannot play anymore. I can't keep up. People are sweats on that game. But, you know, like, somebody like my brother fucking plays that shit every single, like, day. Like, he loves it. Him and his friends love that game. And it's sort of the community. Like, this is the first time in a while the COD community isn't just, like, burning out after fucking May. Because usually COD games die in May. And it's July, and the game is still fucking killing it. So, Yeah, they haven't had a good run in the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. I know for myself, Why? I care for the, like, once it got, like, super advanced, I'm like, this is too much. Exosuits, that kind of crap. I'm like, ah, I don't think so. I just want my, like, World War II or just modern warfare. Hey, <laughs> modern warfare. <laughs> so uh, I definitely lost interest in it. Plus, they got expensive for, like, yeah. shooters, man. Like, honestly, well, they're... They just adapted. Yeah, but they're, like, the, th- the thing is, is that they're, as a game, the only benefit you get is the online play. Their story has always been super lacking. And then now it's gone. Warfare game. ones weren't bad. Black Ops <laughs> ones not bad. I I played a good chunk of mine. I played the most recent ones, like the last couple of years. So I oh, the last couple of ones fucking sucked. sucked. Modern Warfare was pretty good. though. That's a new one. They, they've never they've never really invested much into their uh, into their you know their campaign. It's always been the online play, which I mean they don't have to do anything for it. It's there. It does its own thing. So to justify such a high bill for such a, you know, I'm waiting for it to go really cheap, like 40 bucks, 50% off, kind of something like that. Maybe I'll get it. Um, but other than that, I definitely wouldn't pay what it's what, what it's listed for right now. Mm-hmm. That's do fair. you think that maybe, uh, do you think that first person shooter should have a different price tag than open world RPGs? I actually, yeah, I completely agree with that because your open world RPGs gives you a, a massive world and typically it's an original idea and content being created, right? So, I mean, now, granted, there's been like massive series like Assassin's Creed. The next one they pull out, it's not that original, but it's you just, you're just excited to get the full game, but you get a way more rich story. The gameplay is different. You have to work a little bit harder for it, definitely. 
first person shooters are like it's cut and paste do the exact same thing and just do a little bit better than before and you get your achievements rank up get the guns you want do this do that like it's it's very much the same um and i i definitely agree that it maybe it should be they should definitely consider having a different tier for those types of games like they did for sports games sports games forever they had them really low uh, on the price, uh, for whatever reason, like it was typically like ten, fifteen dollars cheaper, like a, a Madden game, a FIFA game, or something like that at the time. Now everything spiked, so they're all more or less the same price. It's a new game; you're paying that done, eighty bucks mm-hmm. standard. So I have so, no idea. But what I would well, the interesting thing with the first person shooter is oh, sorry, go ahead. What I would propose for FPSs is. is Say, because Call of Duty, like MW, the new MW has a really nice, like, kind of loot system where you can mm-hmm. kind of pay for the battle pass that you see in Fortnite and other games and get, you know, uh, cosmetics and just like different kind of gun variants that you can also unlock just through regularly playing the game. And yeah. you can buy skins for your operators, all that shit. Like, you can't buy, you know, overpowered guns through the game. It's just, like, you can buy guns, but like, they're not, they're not meta destroying where you'll get absolutely destroyed if you don't pay money into the game like Black Ops 3 was. Yeah, uh, I would suggest, you know, like if they want to like lower the price a bit or not like if they want, because obviously they don't want to do that. If they if they ever did lower their price to like say 60 or $70, like even just $10 less, but they, you know, like still had the kind of loot system they do where you can, you know, pay for what you're getting, not paying to fucking gotcha boxes because that yeah. shit should stay on the phone and not fucking move to console. That's a stupid the stupidest fucking idea Call of Duty ever did, even though they made like a billion dollars off of it, which was fucking <laughs> stupid. But I don't know, because like they also get a lot of replayability though. Like again, like people have been grinding it since October and it's July yeah. now. Like almost a full year people have been playing it. So they're getting their money worth my out of it. Thing. Yeah, like it, it, so with a first person shooter that's online, um you're able to get longevity because of the online Mm -hmm. so it almost works out the same which yes if you finish an open world rpg in a hundred and some odd hours and then it's done right obviously you could replay it again but like the reason that you bought it you have it you can like and depending on what the replayability is or if you want to redo it again that's one thing it almost is the same because at least on a first person shooter yes the mechanics are similar but you have that online part that just you keep playing and playing and playing. So if you take the amount of money that you've invested and divide it by the time that you're putting in investing into the game, mm-hmm. like that's where it, they almost like I know I brought up the question, but now like the more I think about it, I'm like, they're almost kind of the same because you end up like your your rate per minute or your rate per hour or whatever is actually pretty low. But that's if you play that one game on a regular basis and play the hell out of it. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's 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 really tough because it's it's hard to judge. We're not we don't make games, so we don't know how much they cost. But I know that the big big machines have a lot of overhead, mm-hmm. a lot of staff. At best, right now, they might be able to take this uh, work from home situation and use it in their benefit to make it cheaper for the games themselves. Yeah, like they don't need to pay for the big offices. They're still able to pump out the games properly from their homes because there's independent guys that are doing it from their basements. You know, mm-hmm. and maybe that will help to to change that. Definitely, the um, server space is what they would need, and and internet, yeah, <laughs> and internet, yeah, yeah, exactly, a proper VPN or something like that. Yeah. Um. Actually, you mentioned Ubisoft. Uh, there was a uh, there was some updates to last week when we were talking about Ashraf Ismail with like the allegations on that he cheated on his wife and stuff. So mm-hmm. supposedly there are reports or there are things coming out of legit abuse of power within ubisoft from the higher ups to uh lower employees yeah. um stuff like that so like again if that's the case that's going on big piece of shit he's still a piece of shit because he's like cheating on his wife don't Who's cheat on the your guy who wife? made uh the avengers bullshit what's his name the directed so it starts with a J. I know it's a super off topic but it'll make sense in a second i'm sorry who who uh directed oh you mean james gunn one. the oh, first avengers uh uh, so it's the J. What the fuck? Because he has a scandal right now. I was really? Justice League. Yeah. Uh, like some shitty about. behavior just like, it relates to the Ubisoft shit. Ray Fisher accuses Joss Whedon of abusive, unprofessional Joss behavior Whedon. on Justice League sets. Hmm. And yeah, apparently all the Justice League act- actors and shit have been coming out saying that 
He was just being a fucking master chode to them. Well, I think that, okay, being a dick is one thing because there are directors out there that are dicks on set, right? But I mean, when being a jackass or being a jerk or being something like that, just like with Ashraf, it's like cheating on your wife. That is a piece of shit thing all on its own, okay? But it's not the same thing as a sexual assault or sexual misconduct, you know? You can't loop them together. That's the reason we talked about where Me Too devolves into a joke because they're just labeling everything. Boy who cries wolf, right? So, but reportedly, if he was, if he was being a chode, that's one thing. Well, okay? his entire but statement if he actually. This is like, yeah, more clear, like directly from so Ray Fisher, the guy who played Cyborg, said yeah, on yeah. Twitter, Joss Whedon's onset treatment of the cast and crew of Justice League was gross, abusive unprofessional and completely unacceptable he was enabled in many ways by jeff johns and john berg accountability is more important than entertainment so that's all i really know i don't know if there's actually more to the story yet so it could like again we don't really know what's being said but like he seems he was being a dick yeah yeah okay i've got i've got people at work that are dicks <laughs> like everyone's got a boss that's a dick they're just a dick well I maybe think it's... it would be worth it if the movie didn't suck ass <laughs> yeah probably but again being a dick is one thing that's just like okay like we just don't like working with him we didn't like him he was mean he was all that like all of that stuff like and and right now that's also not the norm anymore so i think that's another thing to consider but again what's going on at ubisoft though is actual abuse of power when it comes to employees specifically female employees so if ashraf was a part of that not only like i said not only is he a dick for cheating on his wife He's also a fucking massive dick for that shit, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyways, I think it's about time that we finally get into the main event. And that is the pitch. So each of us have chosen a medium, game, movie, TV, and we have decided to pitch a movie, game, or TV with what we would do. If, if someone was like, here is money pick your cast pick your whatever make your movie gentlemen who would like to start i guess i can go go ahead anthony all right so i had like i've always had two ideas for a show uh one is currently about what i'm doing at my movie theater and one is about what i did at my old job at the restaurant triffons so mm -hmm. the one I was kind of like, because again, movie theater, I haven't been there. Like I've been there for just under a year. So like, it'd be hard to kind of, you know, pitch a show because I want, like I usually make the stories because like a lot of the stories that have happened at both workplaces, like they're just really fucking funny. I don't know if it's just funny to me, but like, I feel like it's kind of something you'd see on the office. So the one I'm pitching right now is called, like, it's just, it's based, I, there's not a name for it, I guess. It's just Triffons. But uh, the show is like The Office, but, you know, revolves inside a restaurant. I don't think I would do, like, the testimonials. Like, I'd kind of, like, it'd be the same humor and style of The Office, but, like, more of a Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I guess. Okay. Uh, the restaurant's managed by Tino. Like, all names will obviously change. Tino's just kind of a sarcastic, easygoing boss. He's kind of like a Michael Scott. Yeah, he's kind of just like a Michael Scott, honestly. Like, the, <laughs> that's how it kind of goes. So the workers are me, Blake jesse and darren uh blake and jesse are obviously people you've heard of on the podcast darren was a fucking character and a half like he was an odd man got kicked out of the mall for like stalking a fucking person uh did a lot of questionable shit he was dating a fucking what do you call it? he was dating oh uh, yeah he was dating an inmate that he had never met and like just doing quite i'm not gonna expose the man but he's just doing a lot of questionable shit so those are kind of the main characters. I think like, you already exposed him. Yeah. Well, he's like a fucking 57-year-old racist. It's okay. Nobody's going to mind. <laughs> uh, so a couple of good like ideas from Triffons that have happened. Uh, the main one, I don't know if I would, I think this would be more of a season finale, but it's called The Cracker Thief. So full context behind the story is that Tino one day started noticing there were empty cracker packets like in the back stock room and that somebody was eating crackers. So he proceeded to, like, he wasn't guilty. He claimed he wasn't guilty, but that fucker was eating everything left and right. So he's not really absolved in my mind. 
Uh, but he was like doing a whole interrogation scene. This isn't even a part of the show, but it would have revol- like, revolved around the same idea. So Tino in real life had a whole like web list, like a web work of possible like suspects, where they were, like what days they worked, all this bullshit. Like he was fully fledged. And he was just kind of interrogating everybody. Like, and it was like a week long process. I, at the time, remember eating a single cracker, uh, like right before, like he kind of caught on, but I was not the cracker thief because like somebody was munching back there. Like there were fucking piles. So the episode would kind of revolve around the fact that Tino like noticed the empty cracker and it's a detective themed episode where Tino starts looking for clues and like interrogates employees, like maybe have black and white overlays, some shit like that. As it says in the episode, I ate a cracker when doing stock and realizes that I like I I myself realized that I was a thief, but I wanted to, you know, evade justice. So I become Tino's right hand man when he's like looking for the suspect and re, like I pin the blame on Jesse and he confesses to a crime he never commits. And it's basically just like a whole detective theme episode where I'm trying to evade the law. And that's basically it for the first episode. I don't have any other like in-depth ideas for other episodes, but it's basically like a Seinfeld in a way where there isn't really a story and it's kind of like each episode is kind of just a funny event. So it's not really building up on anything. It's just kind of quick episodes that are based off funny ideas that can, you know, be entertaining. Nice. So it's like an so it's it's like a situational comedy of sorts. Yeah. Oh, I guess fuck. Like every time yeah, some kind of, new shenanigans no happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It almost sounds like yeah, you, bottle what up you've pitched bro. is like yeah, it's like a what? Almost like oh, borderline the bottle episode with like the confession on Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah. Like interrogation is like making the yeah. making people basically. Confess. That's a good point. Like, it's a nice hybrid of like that kind of feel. That'd be very interesting. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Vass. Well, sorry. Was that it? Yeah, that's it. That was that was one of the pitch. Like, I've, there's a couple other ideas, but like they're not actually fully fledged. But yeah, that's that would be the episode I thought the most about the Cracker Thief. So, the Cracker Thief around your situational comedy at the restaurant slash movie theater. Like, would the movie uh, theater no, they'd be one different be very things. close? Like, to I've that? been thinking about the movie theater lately because I've been super bored in quarantine. But they'd be two to like different shows. Would you, do you have like an idea of who you would want to like direct it or write it or would it be all you? See, for me, like, uh, I know, uh, you know, my uncle John lives in Hollywood and I've always like, I've always been talking to him about just like coming out and seeing what he does and him just kind of like showing me around because I'm still interested in doing film in the future. So I'd like probably have him uh, produce or direct. I think, I know he produces and I think he's directed a little bit too. But I'd want to write and like possibly Sweet. star in, depending on how fast I get this fucking going. Because I don't want to be, you know, a thirty-year-old playing a theater employee. That probably won't work out. But I'd want to write or just be involved somehow. Interesting. Oh. Okay, Vass, what do you have? All right, mine's not an original idea. It is uh, actually Zelda: Ocarina of Time. So it's kind of funny you brought it up today. So TV series. Oh. Don't tell me you did the same thing. Nope. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was like, oh. Mine's an original. Oh, okay, perfect. So no, mine's an original. I would do Zelda Ocarina of Time TV series like The Witcher. In okay. the sense it's dark, Ooh. it's gritty, and yeah, a few swears in there. Mm-hmm. So I would have the same director <laughs> because it's he's proven like he's based to get to get the same feel, you want the same director. So you would have that. And I cast it. With the characters, young Link, old Link, young Zelda, old Zelda, Ganondorf, uh, Navi, and the Great Fairy. I kind of do. You have those... actual people? Yeah, I have people. I'm, I okay. just letting you know to my cast list who I'm who I kind of put as a top build people, I mm-hmm. guess you could say, and who I can remember like it's nice. been forever since I played Zelda: Ocarina of Time. So these are the people that stood out the most. So young Link would be Aiden Flowers. So I was kind of looking at like young actors that kind of fit the the look. Mm-hmm. So this guy's very unknown. He's fairly young, like he's in his teens. So I looked up in the in the actual game 
technically like Link and Zelda are like in their like nine years old ish when he's young. And then when it jumps in time, he's in his teens. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you can take some artistic, uh, you know, um, liberties, liberties with that and basically say, okay, these, they'll be teens in this and they'll be like in their 20s or 30s in the older one. So, bear in mind that. But this this uh, young actor, he's not really well known. He's played a lot of like young versions of things, like even the originals, um, The Big Short, he played a young version of someone. So he's, he's done a lot of that kind of stuff. Nothing really to stand out quite yet for himself. Um, but I chose him for Young Link. Uh, young Zelda, I chose Millie Bobby Brown. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, nice. Good. Um, Navi is Maisie Williams. Maisie Williams? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Isaac. fuck. I'm, I don't know why it's been so long. Okay. I start. So I think for the voice, like I could see her like doing the hey, listen, and and kind of like she could be a little cheeky too on top of it, right? She could play a little bit more because again, you're doing a little bit more dark, you're playing it a little bit different. Um, the great fairy is Emma Watson. Okay. Yeah. So again, not much direction on that, other than like they're young, uh, has a little bit of attitude and stuff like that, and has a commanding presence. Like she could, she has that kind of look, so she could definitely do well with it. Um, all right, Ganondorf, Idris Elba. Oh, okay, I like that one. Ooh, actually. nice pick. Yeah, he's good. He's got that yeah. cadence in his voice. He can definitely be sinister, and I think he would definitely fit the bill perfectly. Um, the I mean, old... anything he does is amazing. So just oh, casting yeah. him alone is just the exactly. best. Exactly, and it'd be funny to see him in a red beard. <laughs> oh, I think it'd be a CGI. Oh, yeah. one. I'd hope it'd be CGI. I don't know, Gandorf uh, live yeah, action. Yeah. Oh, he'd have to be. Yeah, he'd have to be like slightly modified for sure, but mm-hmm. make it yeah, work. Yeah. Um, uh, old Zelda, I chose Horsey Ronan. I think she fit the Ooh. bill. Oh, she's got that kind of. She can be a little bit strong. She can play the vulnerable side. Um, and the look is very actually she's got that re, re yeah, she's got that regalness about yeah. her. I was close to picking Sophie Turner, but I felt she was less a little bit too young in a way. And I, mm. but she fits the look, I think, perfectly too. She fits the look, but I don't know if she actually but fits I, like the persona. Um, like she always I just mean, seems really monotone, in everything she does, she can, yeah. And I think that's where I, I kind of lean more towards Rosie Ronan on that one. Um, well, and she and and Sorcy Ronan can oh, also so be yeah. chic very well. Well, exactly. So that's the other thing too. I'm like, I'm like, wait a second. She has to play chic too. So I'm like, okay, I gotta play it like that. So definitely, I, I, I I'm glad with that one. It kind of worked out nice. And then my old Link, the star in a way, even though it's called Zelda, even though he plays Link, which has always been funny. Uh, I choked Alexander Ludwig, who plays Bjorn in the Viking series. Alexander. Let me Google. What's his last name? Alexander Ludwig. Ludwig. Okay. Yeah. I don't, this is the questionable one because okay, he just seems a bit too old. Like he seems too much like a man. He looks just like him, dude. Are you kidding me? He <laughs> Again, looks identical take the to liberty him. of him being a little bit older than what he <laughs> should be, and he kind yeah. of fits it right. Like he's gonna be, he's gonna have that physicality for sure. Again, we're going for the dark and gritty version, so he could be like. What okay. Henry Cavill was to Gerald, Alexander Ludwig could be to the Gerald. Dog. Honestly, Gerald. I'm looking at some like modeling pics of him like fresh yeah. shaven, and he looks much younger than like what the grizzly shit yeah. I saw on the front page. Exactly. So like, yeah, so, he looks young enough. Not with the yeah. beard though. The beard he looks like a fucking like he looks, yeah. he looks like a fucking badass. I'm gonna give him that. Like he's always clean shaven, so you could mm. definitely. Yeah, no yeah. fuck. I'm looking at one. Like it's really weird to look at this, but like, yeah, no, like I can see that now. Yeah. So green hat. Yeah, that's my pitch. That's my cast for I Zelda like of Time. So, would it be like would just season one be the entire game, or would you like have season um, one be Orc Arena and then like expand to like it, fucking dude? It, whatever there's the next the one game is. is actually pretty massive in, in the way I remember it. So you could definitely split everything up quite nicely and like. There's quite a bit of stuff you have to do as a young Link first. Like he has, he's got to do his young stuff first, and then only after a good series of time does he actually get the to- the the Master Sword to jump in time, and then 
more sh- stuff pops off. So like you, you got a few seasons there easily. Like I can't, I, I didn't go depth to like how you could break up. Like I'd have to play the game again. I'd have to know where you're jumping to like, okay, you have to go do this next, this next. It's like, okay, like how can you make it work? But uh, I, you, I think you definitely get two seasons out of it. Minimum season three. one, young link season two, yeah. older link. Yeah. Again. So yeah, that definitely could easily jump like that for sure. So yeah, that's my pitch. Sweet. That's pretty cool. I would watch that. I would definitely watch that. I Interesting. And who, sorry, did you say who you're, who's directing it or right? Like I'm anything like that? You said you're just going with the guys that did Witcher? Same guy, yeah. Tom, Tomas uh, Bajinski. Right. Bajinski. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's sweet. When I saw, when, well, I mean, when The Witcher came out, I was like, that's one of the first things I thought. I was like, God, this would make a really good aesthetic for the Ocarina of Time. Mm-hmm. And like, have those moments of like, the the stones and like the reds the white and the green that they focus on and the master sword with everything like you could really make those stand out oh yeah in such a really cool way mm-hmm. interesting wow vass mm-hmm. i'm like staring at this guy i'm like he he's he's got the face from like for for link yep that's so crazy where was my thing i had my i had my notes okay mine is it's kind of original mm-hmm. okay Okay. But excuse me, but it also in a way is not and I would say it's not because it reminds me where is my I just literally had my fucking notes right here and now they're gone. I'm going to find them. What it is is essentially like three billboards outside of Ebbing. I watched that recently. I'm like, "Oh, that's really good." And then I also watched, um, it was that. So what I have is a TV show. It's a limited series, only one season. So eight episodes. Okay. And it's a dramedy of sorts. All right. And this might seem very close to home, Vass. Okay. But I I, I draw, I drew inspiration from our lives. Okay. Because I wanted to bring it on this episode. Days of our lives. It stars these two brothers, okay? The show stars these two brothers, Sam Rockwell and Bob Odenkirk. Okay. Okay? Bob yeah. Odenkirk is obviously the older brother. Yeah. <laughs> Sam Rockwell's the younger brother. That works, right? Already. Yep. Okay? Um, and then f- their cousin, Frances McDormand, mm-hmm. who she was from the original Fargo. She was in Three Billboards. She's just overall amazing. Uh, and her wife, who's played by Olivia Coleman. Okay. And then Odin Kirk has an ex wife who he still talks to, who is Tony Collette from Hereditary. Okay. And it's it's like a it's like a psychological type of thing, but it's not. It's it's like a drama dramedy, but it's like whatever. And then they it revolves around a psychologist as well. Like so it's Sam Rockwell and Bob, Bob, Bob Odenkirk's relationship as brothers yeah. and their psychologist is, which was funny you brought up Idris Elba, it's Idris Elba. Ooh. Because I recently saw Molly's Game and I loved his character in that. I'm like, first of all, again, like we said, he could do literally everything. Yeah. But just the just the way that he was in that movie in particular and how he was able to bring out Jessica Chastain's character, like bring out those those moments in the movie, I thought were just beautiful. Yeah. The writer and director is Mark Martin McDonough, McDonough, who directed and wrote three billboards. He also did In Bruges and he also did Seven Psychopaths, three movies okay. I love. Okay. And the cinematographer is Christopher Manley, who did the Mad Men movie or Mad Men TV show. Okay. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Mad Men TV show, but that's that. I know it's it's a it's a period piece. This one isn't necessarily a period piece. I just like the aesthetic of it. Okay, it's got kind of that old time look to it, but it's like I forget what that. It's like it's like a more updated sepia tone, but with you know colors. Yeah. So both brothers. So this this is a family story about intent. Both brothers have been seeing the same psychologist and have been complaining about each other. Okay, so Sam Rockwell and Bob Odenkirk, they've been both seeing Idris Elba trying to figure out their stuff, but they both don't know that they've been seeing it. So each episode is going to be them talking to that, talking to him. But Idris actually 
Like he knows that they're brothers, okay. but they don't know that they're going to see him. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like they complain about each other like they, they usually do. They have been on their own for a time. Their only other family member is their cousin, Francis McDermott and her, um, Francis McDermott and her wife, Olivia Coleman. The brothers work together as traveling salesmen for the family business, quote unquote, but haven't been able to get along for quite some time. They always have, but it's mostly like they don't hate each other. It's not like one's an alcoholic, one's a dick, one's whatever. It's just like there's a disconnect there. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a there's communication issues. And but when they work together, like when they go on their sales calls, it's like magic. It's like watching two of like the greatest. It's like watching Jordan and Pippin doing their thing. Right? Mm-hmm. They're just able to bounce off each other really well. So it's there. So they essentially it's this eight eight episode limited series. They work on reconciling their differences with each other um, because they haven't been able to come to terms with the death of their parents. Right? And it's not like one blames the other for each other. Like that would be an easy way to go. I thought, but I was like, no, it's got to be a little bit more complicated than that. Um, But the way that the story is structured, where the comedy part comes out, every episode or each sale they go on, because each episode is about an hour or so, let's say they go on two or three sales an episode, it features a different celebrity cameo. Okay. And each of those sales moments exists as an isolated moment in time, kind of like an SNL skit. So there's this serious nature going around it, but then they go and they have this sales pitch. Okay. And then it's a celebrity cameo from, let's say, like we mentioned him, like Michael B. Jordan. And he's like this steely guy that we kind of have to break through. Or we have someone like Gal Gadot, and we're both kind of like super into, right? Mm -hmm. And, but each one is a little bit quirky. It's a little bit different. So it's almost like you kind of can't wait for the next sales call because you're curious to see who that person's going to be. Yeah. And how it's going to play out and how they're going to work through it. And then each episode is a scene where um, the brothers also go and have a conversation with Frances McDermott and her wife, so and Olivia Coleman, and the two of them always are doing something around their house. So they live in like a they live like on a, on an acreage. Yeah. But every single time you go there, they're working on something different. So let's say you go there and they're working on pottery, and then next thing you go there, they're working on artwork, and so. Not only do the sales calls kind of change with the the type of people, but they're still the same thing. I haven't figured out what they're going to sell yet. I've been trying to figure that out. But every time you go and see McDermott and Olivia Coleman, they're always doing something. So there's comedy in what they're doing. And they're just like, they're always up to stuff. And they're, they're kind of playing gurus to these two brothers. And then Odenkirk is divorced, but he still talks to his wife, who's Tony Collette. So he always, um, uh, he always can like he still talks to her they still have a good relationship and there's always that there's that small thing of like you know that they had a falling out and they've already been able to reconcile it and then sam rockwell he just has a dog the occasional one night stand but it's not like he's like a drunk or he ruins his life all the time and then so the first episode all i have is it just starts off with various quick cut scenes of their session so it opens up and it's like uh, Bob Odenkirk talking about his like divorce, talking about his relationship with his parents, talking about then he like goes with his brother. And then when he mentions his brother, then the brother comes in and then it's like he's talking about like he's kind of closed off to certain ideas or like the, the stuff like. And so it's it's this situ not situational, but it is a dramedy. There is some drama there. And I still haven't figured out if they figure it out in that limited series. And I and I think it's more of like um, that feeling of like when they finally both understand each other. Mm -hmm. So the point is the end of the series is that the two of them both understand each other. They both live in harmony because they know that when they work together, it works great. Their sales calls are awesome. And you get these really interesting cameos from celebrities. And you also get these really funny moments because Francis McDermott and Olivia Coleman are just funny in their own right. Yeah. And then obviously you've got these great moments where you got Idris Elba with like, The way he's just, when he speaks, he's like, again, when you think, if you watch Molly's game, you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's just like really cool to see that. I still haven't figured out, like when I was working through this and I was like thinking about it, I'm like, I don't know where they'd be living. Like a part of me wants them to live in like a place like Philadelphia, for instance, or um, Philadelphia, maybe uh, maybe New York, but like um, major city, maybe like a Staten Island or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. but somewhere where they're not too far from their cousin that has an acreage. Right. So mm-hmm. it'd be interesting. I'm, I'm still haven't figured out exactly like there, there's probably a, <laughs> yeah, there's probably a spot, but anyways, so that's my pitch. I don't even have a title for it yet, but uh, anyways, 
that's my pitch. And it all surrounded around the fact that I really want to see Sam Rockwell and Bob Odenkirk in something together because I think mm-hmm. it'd be awesome. Oh, that's pretty sweet. That's a quite that was a fucking complex one. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like that made ours look like I shit. I told you, man. I wanted to bring it. <laughs> I told you. I wanted to bring it. It took me like this the second I said like this is kind of what I was thinking for the final episode, I was like, I need to bring it because again, it's mostly because specifically me, I always complain about stuff more. Like Vass, you're very like you just enjoy movies and sometimes like you don't di- dissect them, mm-hmm. which is probably for the better because you can enjoy more things. Mm-hmm. And I know Anthony, like you have like you like what you like. Mm-hmm. And so like you're able to like express that in the show that you're wanting to do. And then for me, because I spent a lot of time really dissecting stuff, then I was like, well, I have to bring something that's at least somewhat involved. Mm-hmm. So, we had the comedy, that was the a, adaptation that was from video game, and then the fully fledged fucking dramedy, hmm. of a fucking limited time series. Damn, we have we have range on this episode, guys. We fucking brought it. That's oh. all I got to say. I was so excited when you pitched that Ocarina of Time one, and all I can picture is like, you've seen Waiting, right, mm-hmm. Anthony? Yeah. You said you saw waiting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like when you were picturing that, I was like thinking, I'm like, oh, it's like a TV show waiting style with like all these shenanigans. But like, would you have it in the mall? Uh, so I talked to Tino about this. I want to do it in a restaurant just because it'd be like not a restaurant, but like say like a McDonald's style thing, just because it'd be easier to get away with extra stuff. And it's not like a confined space. But Tino also mentioned that there were a lot of like weird cleaners and weird security guard shit that happens. And we'd kind of be cutting mm. them out of the way if we kind of stirred from that. So I'd say like when I wrote that, I pictured it in like a McDonald's, but it could also oh, yeah. be done in like a mall. It'd just be, that'd be way more writing, like way more to do with like making sure you have stores done and all that shit. It's just like, I feel like it's more of a pain in the ass to do it in a mall. Well, it, it'd definitely be more involved for sure. Like you'd have to, you definitely have to flesh it out. But the thing is you could do it progressively. Mm. Like, for instance, John Wick started off with just John Wick. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of the movie, we got introduced to the Continental in that world, right? I'm pretty sure if it was like with the TV show, like they just keep evolving and they're showing more and more. So like when I picture your guys, if you guys did do it in the mall, eventually you'd have a security guard that comes every day and gets coffee and bitches about one thing. And it's part of it. And then you have that Darren guy mm-hmm. and the security guard completely opposite ends of every single spectrum. So there's always that like, three minute interaction of the two of them just like complaining about the the same thing but on the opposite side and then like the security guard doing doing his thing right and then you have like interesting people that are around that world because i think i don't think there's been anything that involves a mall that has been very effective and malls are really fucking interesting places oh there's a bunch of interesting fuck like trust me man so many stories. Like one. Ex- well, dude, I worked. At, I worked at. I know. I worked at A and W for like a year and a half. You know. But like one of the there's a I story here I, of I get somebody who actually weighed because we were sold a pound of ribs, dry ribs. He actually weighed the ribs when he got home, and hmm. found out it was like zero point nine five, and complained about it. <laughs> <laughs> but like we're not Jeez. scamming them. It's just like it shrinks in the fryer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crazy. Um, Vass, would you go like, uh, when it came to the Ocarina of Time one, is the TV show going to be the whole like adventure from start to finish, which by the way, I'm pretty sure you can get Ian McKellen to be Count Dooku. I'm just, or the great Dooku tree, Count Dooku. Oh, I never, I think Ian McKellen would be. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, would, so like, would you do, like, would you have it like, every episode is a part of that journey so it could be like two or three seasons and let's say you do all the young stuff and the old stuff and then just before you get to the point where you merge the two together yeah oh it, it's or is point. it just kind of like uh like it's just ocarina of time and then it's split up with that game it's for now it's just ocarina of time because I, I i honestly have not played any of the other games to see if they even tie into each other like i don't oh, know if like do it's a stupid fucking mess though so here's the deal like i mean it would make more sense you could leave ocarina of time as its own thing and then you could potentially do the majora's mask and it's like almost like the multiverse <laughs> so the <laughs> multiverse and so you do the majora's mask stuff could come into play breath of the wild could be another one there's the 
There's the other one, the twin something. I can't remember what it was called. Oh, uh, fuck. Yeah. I do know what you're talking about. Yeah. Twilight you know, Prince. That's it. Twilight yeah. Princess. Yeah. I don't so know if one, but... there's lots of. Yeah, I actually, I, I, I actually understood that reference. I played that game. Yeah. So there's lots of content there. I definitely focus on Ocarina because it's definitely our favorite. But um, yeah, you could definitely yep. spin it off and make it like a different world, a different thing. So yeah. But definitely, the- yeah. Like it'd be it'd be cool to see that split up, especially when you get to Gerudo Valley. Like that whole sequence could be like four episodes. Oh, well, think of how many temples you have to go through. Like the water temple alone could be like its own like half season if you truly wanted yeah. to make it worth it like that. And really, you could drag it out a bit. I mean, let's be honest. Like that was like one of the hardest levels for sure to get through. They're one of the temples to get through. So you have the temple scenarios. You have all the power ups to get like. Everything should be, and like verbatim, I would say definitely keep, you get like the bigger on sword, you get the mirror shield, you get the, what else did you get? The, all the tunics, all this, all that. So like, this is where like, it, you have to have that mysticism behind and where the Witcher kind of plays into that very well too. So, you know. yeah, they show, they show the stuff like when it came to his potions and stuff in a really yeah. cool way. Like he had his potions there and he took them to go do whatever. And then Ard was showed really cool. And I'm, I'm hoping that they show his other ones like Igni for sure has to come out next season. Yeah. Like just that fire stream coming from his hands is going to be dope, yeah. which would be kind of like when you do those moves. Um, even if they do stuff like at night when you're a kid and those skeletons come out in Harul Field, you know, I think that would be that'd be really cool. Yeah, and I also want to see that crazy dude playing the song of storm just freak the fuck out when you get older. Mm-hmm. That's true. Just some um, spaz. For your pitch, would you say it could fall along the line like a Coen's brother uh, film, like Burn After Reading or something like that? Just I'm just thinking of the way you have it. You jump scene to scene because different people's lives. Like, do you focus on the brothers in the most part? Or do you focus on the other characters as well? It's around the brothers. The extra cameos are really there to just kind of fill the world oh, okay. and show the kind of things that they, they deal with as like salespeople and how they're able to interact with different people. Like, mm-hmm. so for instance, you get somebody like the Michael B. Jordan character I was mentioning, where he's like, he is like, let's say the brothers have gone back to him three or four times mm-hmm. and he hasn't pulled the trigger yet. Yeah. But every single time they've been able to kind of figure him out a little bit more yeah. and their, their game is just getting better and better and better. And so each, some of them are like super easy where you deal with somebody like, let's say you take a Gal Gadot who plays Wonder Woman, but in this, she's like this very timid and scared lady. Yeah. Which like is completely off type from Wonder Woman. Right. So that'd be a way to like juxtapose, juxtapose like her image. And she just plays this like, kind of scared worried type of i don't know this type of person or whatever and they find ways to be able to like sell her the product right I, and again I, I still don't know what the product actually is but um it, yeah it'd be more just to fill in the area but it is still about the two brothers because it shows moments like as an audience member where you're watching it you're just like oh like let's say whatever you were talking to Idris Elba about in this episode is directly correlated to the three sales calls you had and the conversation yeah you know and so it's like there's these moments of there where and then eventually as this limit like like you get to the eighth episode or whatever it's just like they start to realize what the audience realizes and what francis mcdermott for instance and Idris elba has been telling them the whole time mm-hmm. and then like they've got this these cool moments where tony collette is like you know again they don't have a cliched breakup where they hate each other and it's just hell and everything it's just a mutual break and it's all about like this stuff that would normally happen where there's just been this, you know, just this distance. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been a falling out. Nobody's an alcoholic. Nobody's a wife beater. Nothing that's just like, you know, it's just the, a lack of a lack of communication and understanding on on these just circling around these people and how other yeah. people just help them and how using the community around you and your experiences helps you grow as people and just understand each other a little bit better. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's where that would come in. Cool. Nice. Anthony, anything else? Oh, no, I'm sorry, boys. Apparently, my uh, brother is putting in an Ethernet cable. So I was kind of just like figuring out what the fuck was happening because I like there's just a big ass no, noise okay. the whole time. So I was like, what the hell is going on? So I dipped out for a second to see what was going on quickly. 
What a guy. No, that's okay. We didn't actually notice. Me and Vasily <laughs> were like vibing on Oak of time. Yeah, there you go. It was a fun time. Fuck. Yeah. It was a really fun time. Um, Guys, mm-hmm. that's really all I got. Yep. Gentlemen, yeah. what do you think? What are, Anything else you guys wanted to touch on? This is the final, for now at least, this is going to be the final episode officially because we're closing up part two of our run as the F word as we know it. I just want to say a quick shout out uh, to the main men. Arturo, Jesse, Blake, uh, Ethan, Sergianis. I know like he talks to you a lot with the podcast, but still it's pretty hyped to know that like somebody like my cousin, I, I think, yeah, we're cousins in a way. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we are cousins, yeah. but like, yeah, my cousin, you know, fucking watches the podcast and actually like listens to it all and like has thoughts on debates we have and shit. Like it's just cool to have like people actually care. So shout out to them. Apologies if I missed anybody, but you know, those are the main men. So don't ask. Yeah. And I think in terms of females, it'd be like KF is awesome from back in the day, oh, like fuck. from the so that Instagram. Was a, that's been a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been a long time. Uh, yeah. Those were cool. Those were fun days when we used to have the live stream. Mm-hmm. It's a bit complicated, but oh, and I was nice. hoping that we'd actually be back in the studio. I was thinking about it, but like just with the timeline of everything and the way we ended up like just being like, I think we need to take uh, take our hiatus or whatever mm-hmm. we could have done it in the basement could have done it in the studio set or whatever but like you know you know maybe uh, we'll come back when there's a hype like movie that we want to talk about or some shit like for quick reviews yeah i gotta be down to get like i don't know when one when two comes out or just any movie that we want to talk about if we all go out and fucking see one because even after this i'd still be down to go and check out the new hype movies with you boys yeah for sure Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we all see each other on a regular basis, so it's not like we're going to be it's never not a band seeing each breaking other. Up, yeah. 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 I mean, the band is breaking up in a way, but it's mostly just like on the consistency basis. Um, like, I, like, and uh, if you're obviously at this point, you're on part two. And so it is officially our hundredth episode, uh, episodic one, I guess, because the deep dives do count as episodes, but it's the episode 100. And uh, yeah, it's it's been. It's been quite the ride for sure. And from all of our technical stuff to like, and in that time, Nick got married mm-hmm. and had two kids. Ethan had, uh, had his second child. Cause Georgie's four. Mm-hmm. Um, you got married. Yeah. I got married. Like we've been moving up and down from jobs. I know when our tour was down. Got fucking murdered. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> But then, like, kind of revived back as the as the F word, which could keep, like and keep going keep depending going. on what we want to do with it. I just need to like get adjusted and just chill out for a bit. But like, I do yeah. plan to start posting like within the month, like consistently. Again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and and like I said, you can always always go back and see some of the episodes that we've done. Like, just whatever they're kind of all over the place. But like, I know there's some ep- like podcasts that I listen to that I'll go back and I'll listen to an episode from like a year ago, for instance, and so. Yeah, I don't know. It's been it's been fun. It's been cool. It's been frustrating. It's been all sorts of stuff because it's like really hard putting something together and putting something out there. But like it was people like Jesse and Arturo and KF and like those days and Jimmy would come in and the boys from uh, the boys from Calgary at Real Locker Room Talk like, mm-hmm. you know, and I know that Arturo, I be, like he is starting streaming Ooh, nice. of some kind pretty soon. And so. Uh, as soon as we hear something from that, like it's going to be on our social channel. So like I said, you can still follow the F word podcast on Instagram and be able to like, you know, stuff like that, that comes up and even my personal like one, but I think I said it last week. I won't say it this week. Just go to the F word podcast on Instagram <laughs> there. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. I don't know when we'll be back, but uh, we'll see what happens in the future. And yeah, I got one more had- quick shout out. Uh, Bo, yeah. who was on our second ever episode, like still yes. watches the podcast and like still comment on Facebook and shit. And like we were just like having discussions and like if he has a different opinion, like he'll, you know, message me on Facebook with his opinion and we'll actually have a discussion and shit. Like, so shout out to Bo for being like an OG, like our first ever mm-hmm. guest and like just mm-hmm. still watching. Yeah. We're going to get yeah, him back on. Time. Maybe when the PS5 launches, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we're like, we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll still have all the tech. Mm-hmm. I think uh, we've, it's not like I'm going to get rid of this stuff anytime soon. And uh, if, who knows, if we feel like 
putting up a review on YouTube too, or maybe we'll like record an audio review and like put it up. I don't know. I haven't decided yet, yeah. but we're going to figure it out. We're going to take a hiatus. I'm saying I'm thinking at least like three months, Oh like, yeah, at least until October, I would say just to get a break um, and get some stuff, uh, stuff going on the side. And again, uh, see where that goes. So, uh, and then obviously thanks for Vass for filling in for Nick. I mm-hmm. like Nick wasn't able to be on our last episode. He was one of the original three, but mm-hmm. he's also got a wife and two kids and life is very hectic for him. Yeah. So no, it's been Priorities. fun for me. Yeah. I appreciate being brought on here. And I mean, I'm usually the quiet one and especially when like the rants start going, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to enjoy whatever. And like, I usually don't comment as it is, as I do on like social media. I don't usually use this platform myself either. Like I try to say some opinion and I know, you definitely want more out of me, but definitely. Well, it's been- <laughs> I don't really think so. Like for the, like the debate we we're having, like I noticed you were talking during it, but I was like, you know what? You know like, what? If he's it, not comfortable I, talking, like there's not like, yeah. you're not going to say anything of value if you like, if you don't want to. So yeah, I just like, and, and also like that just comes from experience with my brother G there. <laughs> he just like when he, even when him and Nick go, like I just usually oh. just sit there quiet, and just watch and enjoy watching your parents fight in front of you. Yeah. I am. Um, basically it's like, it's just one of those things like yeah. it's just ingrained in my head. I'm like, I'll just let him say his piece. I'm like, I don't have too much to mention on it. So <laughs> it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much like if anyone's ever had even a minute with this show knows that my thing is all about, freaking getting uh getting into my tangents which we covered we covered we had technical issues in the beginning and we had tangents and then i'm pretty sure i would also argue that this is one of our most articulated episodes mm-hmm. yeah because i know a lot of times at least for myself i have a tough time articulating my point but i think given this time where i've stayed off the socials and i haven't been getting into arguments with people and just thinking about things and i was just like I felt like I was, uh, I, I finally been able to, uh, you know, be a halfway decent host on our very last episode. Mm-hmm. Very good. <laughs> I'd also like to give the shout out All that right. uh, I didn't get bitched this episode. That was oh. nice. That's <laughs> true. Yes, it is true. See, it did get I've, better I've, though. I've the longer it went night. on, the start, the start, mm-hmm. I was just the bitch of the group. But now, well, you just dug your own grave half the time, so that, you know, <laughs> somebody had to. <laughs> no, somebody, anyway, somebody had to. Uh, yeah, but uh, all right. It is with a very optimistic but very heavy heart that it is the official final episode of the F word, and it's been a hell of a ride. It's been super fun as hell, and everybody that has been joining and listening to it, um, it means a ton. And I hope everybody's been. That has been listened to it as I've even thought about starting something, whether it is a podcast or whether it's a hobby or something like that, and you put it out there for people to to take part in and be a part of. It's a it's a big deal when you see people actually doing it. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody that was that has been listening, has been following. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's all I got. And so for the final time, I'm G. I'm Anthony. I'm Vass. And we're out. Mm-hmm.